32. There might be a change today because this is a bit of a rough ride today. We're back into the mountains now as the riders start to cut the way north towards the Swiss borders. And once again, the man putting the pressure on the pink jersey is Luc LeBlanc. A very tough finish to this stage, Phil, because the final climb is over 2,100 metres. Well, he's been the hero of the day so far, Salvadelli. He was in an early breakaway with his teammate, Konishev, who just said, I can't do it, you carry on alone, and that's what's happened. Salvadelli has been setting the pace from a long way out with this very select group here. They're more interested, I think, in the infighting, and there's still 74 kilometres to go. And still Tonkov right there, and on his shoulder, as always, Luc Leblanc. Well, Luc Leblanc has watched him very closely. There's the gap, 40 seconds still to Salvadelli, but there's an awful long way to go. And I think Tonkov looking very comfortable. You see the way he climbs, he just sits there, but he does seem to use a very big gear. New time check for Salvadelli, one minute and two seconds. Well, I don't think it's going to be enough because look at the road that's still ahead of him. This is only the first of the three rather sharp climbs that take them up to the finishing line. And a very, very difficult finish it is today. Ivan Gotti taking over a little bit of control at the front of this group, but still it's Salvadelli at the head of affairs. His lead still hovering around about the one minute mark, but he's going to have a hard time staying in front with over 70 kilometres still to go. Well, he's only a youngster in his first tour, and he's got a very high overall position at the moment, seventh, two minutes, 51 seconds down, so he will cause a little bit of excitement amongst the leaders as we now climb up to 1,100 metres here. This looks like McKelly again at the front as he keeps the line going nicely. Very tough climb these riders facing after 202 kilometres covered in the race. The climb of the Col de San Pantoleon and almost 1600 metres at the summit of this climb. From the Sagli there had his stage win looking quite happy with the way things are going. He won't be under any pressure to work at all because his team leader is right here. Ivan Gotti is also up here in this front group, so too Luc Leblanc. The men that we've come to talk of, Andrea Noah, now up to fourth place overall, he's there as well. Salve Deli still nosing out front. Over two minutes now, so it looks as if he's actually building quite a good lead for himself, but the reaction is certainly going to come over the final climb by the yellow jersey. Now, starting to drop down a little bit, one minute 52 over the pink jersey group of the leader, Pavel Tonkov. So as we look down now, that little group is now one minute and ten seconds behind Salvadelli, who went over the top of the Champ Premier climb, about 48 seconds in front of Kepi Gonzalez, but the gap is opened up just that little bit. We're now on the climb of the Pantaleon Pool. A group of five riders getting clear. Nice to see Axel Merckx very aggressive over the last few days. And this could be one of the deciding points of the stage on the foot slopes of the Col de San Pantaleon as Merckx gets away with Gonzalez and Michele. And another rider get in there from Aki, and I think that might just have been Gazelli. A more or less 20 miles, 30 kilometres or so to go to the finish. This is the composition now of the chase group. And there is Axel Merckx. He's starting to look good these last couple of days. There's the climb that they face now. It's 15 kilometres long, this climb, lifting them up to 1,127 metres. And here is a rather tired Salvadelli now. He's had his moment. He's been out in front an awful long way, going clear at the 80 kilometre mark with his team captain, Dmitry Konishev, and then going on by himself on the back here wearing number 19 Nicola Michele who certainly has been a revelation of this year's tour as they catch Salvadelli and a lot of the work being done at the front by the little climber from Mercatoni Uno that is Pelliccioli so there's Salvadelli and a little uh, little show of appreciation there from Nicola Michele who said well done to him and now we're settling down onto this long long climb as I say somewhere around 30 kilometers from the finish there's Kepi Gonzalez in the action again, sitting on the wheel of number 21, who is a Focconi from the Amore Vita team, fresh off the win yesterday of Glenn Magnusson of the team. And the pressure going on again. Well, this is Sivan Gotti decided he's going to try and go out of the group. There is Salvadelli. He's going to disappear straight through the main field. But a good move by Gotti. And in fact, for once, the pink jersey of the leader, Pavel Tonkov, isn't there. Well, this is Stefano Garzelli who's got onto the back wheel of Gotti. Sort of a headless team, Mercatoni Uno, with the loss of Pantani, which is a great shame. Now, what is the man from Mappe going to do? Because Gotti has been such a good bike rider in the Giro d'Italia this year, and he's beginning to force the pace. 
Gotti and Garzelli are trying to get up to the leaders. There's the remnants of that breakaway. And in fact, look at Gotti as he comes up alongside them. Axel Merckx takes a good look, clearly getting himself ready here to jump on the wheel of Gotti and grits his teeth, but I'm not sure he can, Paul. Well, that was a remarkable reaction by Ivan Gotti there. He's come across, this is a sort of leapfrog situation. He's got to the group of five riders, but nowhere to be seen is the pink jersey of the leader of the tour so far, Pavel Tonkov, and he's only got one teammate with him. That's De Grande, and as always, the yellow jersey of the Palti rider, Luc Leblanc, sitting on his slipstream. And behind him is little Pipoli, but I tell you what, this is the first time in 14 days of the Giro d'Italia we have seen the Magli Rosa under pressure, and this time it really looks as though he's relying heavily on the pacemaking of Giuseppe Di Grandi. Now Axel Merz gritting his teeth but still trying to go with the moves while there's a big reaction from behind. Well, a little bit of help coming from the Pulte team at the front. Now this is a situation for them because they've got a man in the breakaway with Axel Merckx but also the overall position of the man Luc Leblanc is disappearing so they're going to have to chase their own man. Ivan Gotti here trying to get back up to Axel Merckx doing a very good job indeed. Also Nicola Michelli number 19 sitting on his wheel too but what a remarkable finish this is going to be. Now, Michele becoming something of a name in this year's year. He's only ever had one win as a professional rider. He turned pro back in 1993, but he's riding like a star this year. Anyway, he's latching onto the lead group, and again, his little Kepi Gonzalez as we come up towards the top of the Pantaleon. And Kepi Gonzalez looking for the points here that will give him the lead in the King of the Mountains. And I don't know whether he'll find too many people to challenge him, because I think Gotti has other things in mind here. He is prepared to get this group working together. He's not interested in the King of the Mountains as Gonzalez presses on towards the summit. Well, as they get to the top of the climb here, just under 400 metres before they go over the top, and then it's a big descent down into the valley at Antne Saint Andre, and then the final climb up to the finish of Bril Servina. Well, Kepi is doing all of the work here. There we are at the summit, we're 29 kilometres from the chequered flag. And in fact, Kepi Gonzalez is keeping the pressure on, but now Luc Leblanc himself is having to take up the chase. Kepi goes over the top ahead of Ivan Gotti. That's the order, the first two over the top. Merckx was in there as well. A little bit further down, a certain amount of panic coming into the main field. There's Luc Leblanc leading them over. Now it's the turn of Pavel Tonkov to sit on the Frenchman. But there's the gap, 23 seconds is the advantage of Ivan Gotti's group over the group of the pink jersey. A very difficult descent now down into the valley before the road then tilts up again all the way to the finish line. And then it's the climb of Il Cristallo taking them up towards the finish. It's a climb which takes them up to around about 2,000 metres, so it's a tough one. Very difficult indeed, you can just see how far it is down into the valley there. Gotti losing a little bit there in the corners. In fact, it was Michele's fault because Michele sat up and let the leading group of three riders go clear, and now Gotti must shut it down in one of the corners. Well, this is the most interesting move now. We're seeing Ivan Gotti, he's taken his chance well. This is a, a hilly stage which has come as an interlude between the undulations up in the north of Italy. But very soon, of course, we'll be heading into the Dolomites and three very tough days indeed. There's Gotti. He really has thrown the cat in among the pigeons now and he's been joined by Kepi Gonzalez and Nicola Micoli, two very strong riders in the mountains this year. Well, Axel Merckx has been put under pressure because he's been dropped from the leading group of five, but now the reaction has to come from the pink jersey group because Ivan Gotti was third overall this morning. He's going to be a very big danger to this man in the red jersey. In fact, Merckx was still in front. I think, in fact, also got back there, Paul, Stefano Garzelli. He was also in the action. This is a much thinning out group here of the pink jersey who's taking his glasses off there as uh, the group tries to get something going, but this little workmanlike group, here it is now, it's got itself together, and uh, that was either bus number 11 or 11 kilometres to go that just went through our screen there. But there now is Stefano Garzelli in the Mercatoni Uno squad, and this is Gotti. Gotti, I think, will just throw this stage away to make time over the men behind. This is his big chance now to break the pink jersey of the Giro d'Italia. This could be the weakness now, I think, for Pavel Tonkov, because he's only got one teammate in this group, and he's not going to find too many friends. And nice to see, in fact, Evgeny Berzin for once accompanying the leaders in the mountains. Well, Evgeny Berzin's still in this race, but we lost a day that didn't start, in fact. Piotr Ugrimov, the Tour of Italy this year, proving just a little bit too much for that great man. He's out as this field gets smaller and smaller. 
Well, I didn't think Von Gotti was looking for anybody to help him there. I don't think anybody could actually help him. <laughs> the speed he's going up the climb there, these riders actually suffering to try and stay in some kind of slipstream. And behind, you can see the pink jersey is visibly going slower. Just look at the speed here of Gotti now as he continues to ride. Merckx has come back. Big, long, thin legs of Eddie Merckx. He's most unlike the build of his father, Eddie. But Axel now riding extremely well. Certainly has improved since he first rode the Tour of Spain as his first major stage race. And a little bit of panic, I think, starting to appear on the face here of Pavel Tonkov because he realizes that his major challenger is Ivan Gotti. And Gotti is a very good climber. And he's the one at the moment putting all of the pressure on the front of this group and riders just getting shelled out. Well, Tonkov doesn't make many mistakes, and one must presume to allow Gotti to escape like this, he couldn't do a thing about it. He marks his men so well, Pavel Tonkov, but right now there's nothing he can do. He is conceding time, and if he concedes more than a minute and seven seconds, then he will lose that pink jersey to Pavel, to uh, Ivan Gotti. Well, he's used his teammate up completely there, now he's decided to take the race into his own hands and he's in fact accelerated and caused a lot of confusion behind there, many riders being left behind but in the lead group still Ivan Gotti on the front setting all the pace Kepi Gonzalez looking very comfortable just sitting in the slipstream there but it's now down to just three men, two of them sitting in the slipstream of Ivan Gotti who's doing all of the work and not asking any help well, that's the way it should be if you're about to pick up the Maglia Rosa in the Giro d'Italia. And if that time gap survives to the Tonkov people, he group, that's exactly what he will do. And what a present as well, because tomorrow we race into the home area of Ivan Gotti. And you can guarantee there will be tremendous support for him. And I'm sure they're locked into the television watching this right now. So Gotti climbing now, the face of Pavel Tonkov, under pressure for the first time in this year's Giro d'Italia. So far, he's won all of the key stages. Now he's about to lose this one I think because the gap is opening and this man has shed everybody now except Nikola Mikeli. Well Mikeli looking very comfortable indeed just sitting there letting Gotti do all the work he realizes that the man from Seiko is the one who's looking to try and get the pink jersey well further down the mountain at 1 minute and 42 seconds it really is a time trial for the man wearing number one all he can do is ride a consistent last six kilometers and hope that he doesn't lose too much time over the little Italian climber Certainly no help coming uh, from people here who's just sitting behind him, but maybe he can't help him now. It's so mano o mano on the climb here up towards the finish. Ivan Gotti has never asked anybody to assist him, and he's riding with a tremendous tempo, and that's probably the reason why. Here's the chase as the two others go into the tunnel. As we go out the other side, otherwise we'd lose our pictures. Five kilometers to go now. And that's the gap, 1 minute 40, he's creeping back. Well, it's just two seconds, but all of the time, the man from Psycho at the front setting the pace. But this man certainly could be the master tactician. He could have decided not to respond to the attacks of Gotti and just pace himself over the final five kilometers, but three kilometers to go. And in fact, Mikkeli has now cracked. No attack has come, he's just ridden him off the wheel. The tempo has been absolutely amazing by Ivan Gotti, this man who finished second in the Tour of Italy as an amateur back in 1990. He's led the Tour de France for a couple of days when he lost that lead to his teammate Bjorn Arise. And we all know what happened to Bjorn Arise. And now Ivan Gotti is looking for a Maglia Rosa of his own. Well, he's certainly flying up this climb. He hasn't asked any help from anyone in the race so far. He's gone to the front, he's set the tempo, and every one of these riders has just popped off his wheel. And now he'll be looking not only at a pink jersey, if he can keep that 1 minute and 40 second gap at the top, but also a brilliant stage victory. Well, the Italians are recognizing their man because he's not living too far away from the finish of today's stage of the Giro d'Italia. And they're going to shout him all the way home. And now the pink jersey of Pavel Tonkov, the shine has gone a little bit, but you've got to hand it to Tonkov, Paul, because he's rid himself of everybody else in the chase back. Certainly got rid of Luc Leblanc, the man who's been his limpet mind for the last few days every time the race has gone uphill, but now he has to ride the time trial. He's gone out again a little bit, 1 minute and 46 seconds, but he must really pull himself together at the moment because once they get to the top, it actually descends a little bit down to the finish line, but it looks to me as if Pavel Tonkov is in serious difficulty. Well, the same can't be said of this man and he wasn't too happy with that either. Very aggressive indeed, he's concentrated on the job in hand, he doesn't want too much cold water on him because at this altitude it really does make you cold and it is a difficult thing for a rider to, to have on his jersey because all that water is absorbed into the jersey, in fact at the end of the day making the jersey probably four or five pounds heavier. 
Well, that's certainly not what you want on the last climb of today's stage of the Giro d'Italia. A massive crowd has turned out now. This race has shook off the image of being a training event for the Tour de France. It's now a bike race in its own right once again. And Ivan Gotti is thinking only of the pink jersey as leader of the Tour. There's the race behind and Tonkov, there's one or two passengers coming up now because Chef has got on board as well. He is a very persistent rider, this Kazakh. Certainly has shown himself this year in the Tour and recovered as well to come up to the wheels of those two riders who are in third and fourth position on the, mo on the road at the moment. Let's not forget, Nicola Michele is somewhere in the middle of all this trying to survive as well and hold on to second place. The gap has stretched once more to 148, so in fact, this man now is feeling the attraction of the finishing line. He's increased his lead by eight seconds since the last time check. Well, as popular as Pavel Tonkov is in this race as a former winner of the Tour of Italy, I think the Italian crowd getting a little bit partisan <laughs> now because they can see for the first time a serious Italian contender for the pink jersey at the end of the day. Yes, and they've got used to foreign winners in this tour over the years with uh, Pavel Tonkov, Evgeny Berzin and, of course, Miguel Ingerain. But now with 100 metres to go, and they're going to get themselves an Italian winner of quality today because I think, as the time will tell us shortly, he'll be the new leader of the Giro d'Italia. And so we never really thought that Pavel Tonkov would lose his overall lead. He's looked such a solid man. But today, Ivan Gotti has found a chink in his shining armour and he's hit him hard. Well, it's going to be difficult to pull back any time now. Just two kilometres down this little descent into the town here. And Gotti's not going to lose any time at all. But it was amazing to see the way he rode up that climb. He had the speed just to pop everybody off his back wheel. There's the kilometre kite. He will have been waiting for that for quite some time. But look at the speed. 80, 75 kilometres an hour. That's nearly 50 miles an hour. No, absolutely no chance now. Paul is going for it all of the way. He wants that jersey for the first time in his life. He won't be thinking of victory in Milan right now just at the moment. This stage victory will do and the present that comes with it he's converting a 67 second deficit this morning into whatever the clock tells us later on he's got now in the lead a tricky little finish this at the top of this mountain as he comes into the finishing straight it's a few little zigzags but for him he won't even worry too much about the victory salute because to him what's most important at the moment is the time gaps that he can increase over the main challenges now here he comes the great moment for the little man Ivan Gotti now he salutes the crowd, he's got the stage win and the clock starts now. And once those 67 seconds have gone by, he will be the new leader of the Giro d'Italia. And we're going back quite a way here to these pictures, still are probably one and a half kilometres out to Pavel Tonkov. Tonkov, you can see at the front of this group of three riders, had no help at all from the riders in the group because obviously he's the man got the most to lose and when you're in a situation like that, you don't have any friends. Well, now we've got trying to make some ground up here is uh, in fact uh, Gonzalez comes over he'll get fourth Tonkov was just behind in the official gap was a minute and 46 Nicola Michele did get in in second place also surviving the breakaway was Gazelli there is Luc Leblanc he's losing big time as well and here's the man that's caused all of the distraction today Ivan Gotti the stage victor and indeed the new leader of the Giro d'Italia now by my calculations it'll be round about 50 seconds to the good so he gets the victory and a big surprise he gets the pink jersey I don't think anybody expected that the overall situation now Ivan Gotti the leader ahead of Pavel Tonkov by 51 seconds Leblanc is third but three minutes and two seconds back Pipoli is fourth and now we're off into the Italian Lake District here, 173 kilometres the ride today as we go from Veres to Bordomonero. And again, the attacks are coming thick and fast, but it looks, Paul, as though we're having in the rain, believe it or not, a little bit of respite for the race lead. I think they've been suffered uh, a setback yesterday with that great ride by Ivan Gotti. Well, this is very often the, st the situation in the race after a tough day in the mountains. Wearing 151 and his raincoat over his pink jersey was the leader of the race now, Ivan Gotti and the man not in pink anymore just going through in the next position there was Pavel Tonkov over the top of the Motoroni the big climb of the day at 110 kilometers and uh, Riccardo Focconi is taking the lead over Baronte or Baronti rather he's the rider by the way who replaced uh, Claudio Chiapucci who was thrown out uh, before the start of the Tour of Italy when he failed a routine uh, uh, blood test and so Baronti in the breakaway today a third year professional here's the chase group behind and they're not very inspired by the weather at all four minutes and two seconds the gap 
I certainly feel they won't take too many risks on this descent because they don't want to come off and it is a very treacherous descent you can see just how narrow it is and as is often the case in these mountain roads they've been resurfaced just for the tour of Italy well there were 14 men set the race pattern today but that lead group looks to me as though it's thinned out quite dramatically on the climb of the Motorone it's hard to recognize the riders now it's gonna be a nightmare at the finish for the photo finish cameras if the riders continue to wear their overclothing here they're still coming down poor at a respectable speed, nearly 60 kilometres an hour. The Magli Rose are taking no risk, but it is closing in. They went over the top at 4.2. It's down to 3.45 now, but there is nobody seriously who will affect the overall top six riders in the race. They're led here by number 21, Forconi, and they're joined by Baronti and Salvadelli. And interestingly enough, he's the man who set the race alight yesterday, and he's still in the action once again. Well, he's only a young man, but he's certainly got a feeling for this Giro d'Italia this year. For the Coney, by the way, he was the first man over the top of the Motoroni, with Baronti just behind him. Very, very hazardous now as we move on to the next climb. It's not a very long climb, this one, but as you can see, conditions are treacherous here. It really is difficult to race in conditions like this. For Coney, wearing 21 for Amore Vita, setting the pace here, and it looks very much as if this group now is just down to four riders with a four minute gap over the main field and people in fact being caught out today two minutes behind the leading group of the yellow of the pink jersey and in fact that is going to send him out of the top ten overall if he continues to trail by over two minutes on the pink jersey group and a move there by Pavel Tonkov thought he could catch out Ivan Gotti hard to, hard to spot him there with a raincoat and a Seiko jersey on top of his pink jersey but he's not going to get away from that man quite so easily. Isn't it strange how the roles have changed though? Only yesterday it was the other way around and now it's having to be left to Pavel Tonkov to do the attacking and the figure there in the white cape, Ivan Gotti, he is doing the following. No reason to attack now, he's got a 51 second gap over Tonkov and then it goes out to over three minutes over the rest of the field. Must be a nice feeling. Well, a big advantage for Gotti now to know that he's going into home territory. He'll be just looking at the back wheel of this man, Pavel Tonkov, realising I'm going a lot better than you are on the climb. So what's the point of trying to attack me here? But he will try and attack him every time that he can. If it's not on the uphills, it'll be on the descents. So Gotti seems to have everything under control, but then we did think about that when Pavel Tonkov was in the pink jersey, but he's riding there quite steadily. The group is 3.28 behind, so they're not really getting any closer. It's all hovering around the same gap, but it looks as though the rain may have stopped coming down now, because I think that was Gotti throwing off his racing cape. He's still got more jerseys on because we can't see his pink jersey. Well, this is Gotti in second position here now, getting his teammates to the front. I don't think they want any more surprise attacks like that one from Pavel Tonkov. So what they will do now is try and keep the pace high enough to discourage anybody from trying that again. Well, it might damage the leader group up front, but not by a lot. You just saw a caption there. It said uh, Gotti was fifth in the Giro d'Italia last year and uh, trying to go five places better this time out now, which is something of a surprise. Two years before that, he was also fifth in the Tour de France, so he is a man used to riding the big stage races. And that was lucky Luc Leblanc putting his hand up there with a little problem, probably asking for another raincoat. Minute 44, they're saying there now, so the gap is obviously tumbling down. If that's the gap to the leaders on the road, here they are. And the, what was originally 14 men has thinned out. It looks like we've got four riders going clear here. Alessandro Baronti, there he is. And no, that's a, that was Schaefer. We've gone back to the main chase group now. They don't give us long to check them out, do they? But this is the main field back here. Uh, they're just keeping a nice tempo going now. But we can tell you in that breakaway now is Salvadelli, Baronti, uh, Filippo Casagrande is up there. And so too is the very consistent Riccardo Focconi. He's been riding well over the last few days, but so is Salvadelli, and he's the man who could cause a surprise here when it comes down to the last few kilometres, the last metres, I should say, because he is a very rapid sprinter when it comes down to this kind of a finish, but when there are only four men in it, it really can be precarious. Well, they're trying to get the cars off and lead the four riders to conduct the sprint, and there goes Salvadelli. He's made the first move in a dash for the line. He's got the most to gain, lying 16th overall, but nearly 15 minutes behind the leader, but a stage win will be nice. He's being chased now by Baronti. 
who's tucked in nicely at the back. Look at Bronte's face as he kicks hard on the shoulders there of Casagrande. This could be a dream victory for the man who replays Claudio Chiapucci. He gets it. Alessandro Bronte will not believe it. In the race just 48 hours before the off and he gets the stage victory. Further down now, the sprint goes on and Noe takes out the sprint here and around about 50 seconds the gap. But just look at the celebrations here on the finishing line. The first reserve who carries a team captain Captain's number is the stage winner of the Giro d'Italia today. And this is how he did it. We're looking at the face here of Casa Grande. But on the far right, we're looking at the sprinting legs and the drain water dripping off his hat too as the man Alessandro Baronti gets the stage win. <laughs> Terrific result for him. Doesn't affect the overall at all. As we go on now to what is the 16th stage of 158 kilometres and the overall situation is still exactly the same. And so too the race, Paul, because this has been a fairly routine stage so far. And the riders passing very close to Milano on their way to head up to what will be the Alps. And there's the devil on his holiday in Italy, probably getting a little bit of practice for a couple of months' time when they'll probably see him on the roads of the Tour de France. Another little breakaway going away here. Joining it is Fabiano Fontanelli, a very quick finisher. And in fact, this is a surprise move because there are four MG riders got clear. Well, as we get down towards the finish here, 25 kilometres away from the finish, it lives one Ivan Gotti. So I would think there's going to be a lot of people there at the finish while the sprinters again are trying to set this up. And they're all coming up towards the line. There he is, the man in the mauve jersey again, Mario Cipollini. A little bit far down the line, I think, this time. Well, certainly, I don't think he's too worried. I think he feels today that he may well have just left it a little bit too late. But that was a great move by those four riders from MG Techno Gym. But I think they may well have gone too soon. Well, Magnussen's leading them out. But I think he this time he hasn't made the most of it because the MG boys are taking over. Fabio Fontanelli trying to put his head down. He tried a few days ago to get the win. Or was it a week ago? This time he gets it. Fabio Fontanelli ahead of Fabio Roscioli. Angelo Lecce was third. And uh, Volpi was there. Magnussen faded back into fifth place with the win for Fabiano Fontanelli. Overall, again, no change. Gotti with 51 seconds over Luc Leblanc. Three minutes back for him. And there is the confirmation. That further down, Sheffer doing a great ride at 3.40 and Mikkeli still up there in fifth. As the race goes on to a 200 kilometer 17th stage and the riders now beginning to get back into the undulating countryside. We're heading towards the Dolomites now. Well, from Dalmin to Verona and once again the weather not too bad at least the rain is keeping away for these riders and once again Kepi Gonzalez has found himself in the action in the green jersey now as the leader of the King of the Mountains he's looking for a stage victory and as he did in the Tour de France he certainly knows how to be a competitive rider in the mountains and on the flat well, the little circuits at the finish here, there are five of them and there's a little lump every time around. It's just the place for a springboard. It only takes the riders up a couple of hundred metres, a climb, brings them up to a 300 metre top height, but it's caused the breakaway and now will they stay away to the end as they keep uh, just a slight advantage here. Alessandro Pozzi moves over and then the rider he's letting through here in the gap is Gualdi, Medico Gualdi. He was a rider, a former world champion, but he's never really had a great career as a pro. Had a very difficult time breaking through after winning the Amateur World Championships in Japan. But it may well be, if he could just get one victory under his belt, that he could do it. There's Gonzalez, a little fox of an attempt there. He just thought he'd try them out and see what their reaction would be. What a character. He just took one look at him and smiled. Now he's starting the sprint for real this time. As he goes into that corner flat out. Now take it easy. One or two haven't made corners at that angle. But now he's making a dash for the line here. Gonzalez. He's such a cheeky rider. He's the leader of the King of the Mountains. He can finish on the flat as well. He's fainted again. He sat up once again. The other two riders are, by the way, are Pozzi and Merico Gualdi. These three just ahead of the rest of the race here. But they're going to have the sprint to themselves now. And again, you see, uh, Gonz uh, Gonzalez has tried to. But now he's been put into the back seat. It's an awful long way down there, Paul. But it is. It is Pozzi on the front now. Gualdi coming up through the outside. It may well be that he's going to get his first victory. Well, that's amazing. It looked so much as if it was going to go to Pozzi. But on the line, Gualdi gets for him what will definitely be the biggest stage victory of his career so far. So Mirko Guaraldi, turned pro in 1993, at last gets a victory as the main field start to sprint it out for the rest of the places here. Around about half a minute back and Piccoli comes over there and gets the fourth or fifth, fourth place it is. Yes, that's right. There's the winner, Mirko Guaraldi, and he at last gets a big victory.
His life has been dogged by injury. Now we move on to the 18th stage here. Now we can see the beauty of Italy shining down. As we make our way now uh, down to Cavalese. And this is a stage of which the riders will now be facing up to one or two hills but nothing too much it finishes a slight uphill drag that's the overall situation 51 seconds still the gap no change at all yesterday three minutes two seconds to Luc Leblanc Chef and Michele Guirini still up there too in sixth and uh, a lot of those riders by the way are often training partners where they live in Italy now all important time trial the race against the clock we haven't seen one since stage number three of the Giro d'Italia we saw what Tonkov did then the, I wonder if uh, Ivan Gotti had a sleepless night Paul well Ivan Gotti not a great time trial and in fact I think very worried about the fact that in this 40 kilometer time trial he only has a 51 second advantage over this man starting now Pavel Tonkov who really is a good time trialer, especially when he knows at the end of this 40 kilometers there is a pink jersey waiting for him but I wonder what he feels like Paul because he's right that bicycle now which has been thrown out by the commissaires on his spare bike he's the arrival of Evgeny Berzin he's going to set the marker though so little Berzin has done a good time trial 22 seconds to the good to go top of the leaderboard now these look like the feet of Ivan Gotti and he's waiting now for his start he starts behind Pavel Tonkov and he knows if he can just hold his own against Tonkov today he'll have a real shot at this Giro this year because from tomorrow Paul there are 11 mountain passes to climb well that's going to be his terrain but he's not on his terrain this afternoon because in this time trial it's a very flat one and I think the advantage must certainly go to Pavel Tonkov unless of course Ivan Gotti can pull something very special out of the bag a nice gentle start he's taking no chances on this rather twisty exit from the town and then he'll get down into his rhythm he certainly will need to find it quickly. I think he'll be glad to get this race underway now because once you're underway, you only think of racing all the pressure of the feeling of nerves. There's the bike of Tonkov. In fact, the fairing has been removed that they stopped them riding with on. Uh, but even so, he's now on his spare machine and he was only given literally minutes warning to change bikes. So he's not going to feel too happy about that. Chance here just to see how powerful Pavel Tonkov is. There's a little accident out on the road there. Looks as if it might that have been Sheffer. Sheffer. Yeah. I wonder what uh, that was all about. Well, let's have a look because here he was oh he's locked his bike up and he's about to hit that pizza stand if he's not very careful oh my goodness me what a shock for everybody down there well let's hope he's okay well he is because we've just seen him pushed off at my goodness me he went piling into the bread bin or something down by the back wheel of the pizza truck anyway this is Luc Leblanc on the same descent now and he's also in trouble and this is much more serious Luc Leblanc hits the wall coming down the mountain almost the identical spot Sheffer was a just bit further down by about a hundred meters but again this descent has caught two top riders out here but I don't know how Luc Leblanc Paul has come to remount like that well he was really taking a lot of risk there and that must have hurt him going into that wall because the wall certainly didn't move very much let's hope no let's hope that the same thing doesn't happen to the other two men out on the road especially the pink jersey of Ivan Gotti well Tonkov safely down and Gotti was about to approach it we've gone down to the finishing line this is Gonchar here and this is going to really hurt because look at this time a minute and eight seconds better than Berzin that is an incredible ride by Gonchar to put him on top of the leaderboard he's really pulled one out there still Tonkov looking very strong indeed but you know Phil I think Ivan Gotti's doing a very good ride here in this time trial he looks very fast he looks comfortable he's right down on that aerodynamic position as we go through there in fact Tonkov is a long way down on the two best time He's a long way down, perhaps on the best time, Paul, but he is only eight seconds behind Tonkov at the first check, which has come at just under 10 kilometers. So if he continues to lose at that rate, he will conserve an awful lot of his lead. Well, this is the situation at 31 kilometers. Gonchar is in the finish too with the best time, was the best rider here. Tonkov, look, a six time for him at 146, and we still have Gotti to arrive there. There he goes through it now. He's gone through, in fact, 21 seconds slower than Tonkov. So he's way off the leaderboard, but the man he wants is only 21 seconds quicker than him. Luc Leblanc looking a little bit pained here. You can see he's rocking the top part of his body, I think shaken by that crash, and may well have been that he's hurt himself a little bit more than he would have liked to. 
I think Paulie Canoni have got up there on pure adrenaline because that was a terrific smash into the wall and let's hope he is okay. Here's the pink jersey. Now he's not losing time quick enough to hand his jersey over just yet to Pavel Tonkov and I wonder how well he'll finish because a little bit of a drag coming up now as we go back to Leblanc finishing. The man with all of the injuries, he'll be straight in the ambulance I think. Loses 3 minutes and 48 seconds to Sergei Gonchar. 23rd place for him but you know Ivan Gotti doing a very good finish to this time trial here you can see the different styles of the two riders on either side of the screen the powerful side of the blue jerseyed Iva and Pavel Tonkov on the right you can see using a lot of power but on the other side it's energy that's keeping the young man from Italy going well here comes Tonkov and surprisingly too he is not racing the first place in fact, he's just getting scraping in there. That's not a great ride by Pavel Tonkov at all, leaving just the pink jersey out on the course. 21 seconds down at 31 kilometers. That's just nine kilometers from the finish. And it looks to me as though Gotti is going better than Tonkov now. Well, he's fighting. He's riding on enthusiasm. He knows what he has to do to get inside and keep the pink jersey. Pavel Tonkov's finished, and he'll be waiting just to see exactly how many seconds tick by before Gotti comes home. Well, I tell you what, Gotti is riding very close to Tonkov. Tonkov's just gone through the screen there. Gotti will be slower than him, but you know he has pulled back over these last few kilometers. As he searches for the seconds up the line, he keeps his pink jersey. That's another big surprise in this year of Italia. He finishes now with a time of 50.02, and compared to 49.48 of Tonkov, he only concedes, uh, what was that, 14 seconds, so he did come back. There's the result of the stage, as Sergei Gonchar, his first big win, he is also the time trial champion of the Ukraine. He gets the stage ahead of Berzin and Boscardin, but overall, Gotti keeps his pink jersey by 37 seconds over Pavel Tonkov, and that's the lead he takes into the 19th stage today, which will take Take the riders now 222 kilometers and again the weather is pretty miserable a very tough stage too with the Sima copy on this stage as well the highest point of the tour of italy at 2240 meters and once again the man looking for the action kepi gonzalez what a man every time there's a possibility of a breakaway he's there and you can see him wearing the green jersey as king of the mountains well he's becoming a very solid leader in the king of the mountains now uh, peakley no longer a challenger here here's the tonkov group as they're now trying to put things to right here, the pink jersey of Ivan Gotti, he really is in his element now after yesterday's time trial and he didn't lose that lead and he must feel now the race has swung in his favour. Gonzalez uh, attacks and counter-attacks and now he's waiting for the arrival of a straggler. In fact, that's one of his teammates there, but a little bit further down the road there's been a sharp reaction by Ivan Gotti and that has put Pavel Tonkov into difficulty. He's joined by 178 Giuseppe Guerini of Polti, the first time we've really seen him in the mountains, but now Gonzalez trying to sort something out at the front with his teammate Jose Luis Ribiera. Well, Ribiera also riding well. In fact, the Kelme team are riding well in this year's Giro d'Italia, while Tomkov is no longer in the frame now. There he is back in this group. He's allowed the pink jersey, his freedom again, and Ivan Gotti seems to like riding in the bad weather. Certainly does. He's here in the moment, in the slipstream of the man in front of him, Guerini. And further down, Tomkov really starting to suffer, not finding any friends either at this part of the Giro d'Italia. Sitting on his wheel there, one of the Saiko riders, he's just defending. And that was Dario Frigo. Well, Frigo isn't going to help, that's for sure, as now Tonkov is finding the pressure of having won this tour last year. Something perhaps we may well find Ivan Gotti gets next year, because now things are beginning to look good here. He knows he is gaining more time over the field here. Luc Leblanc, we are told, is in desperate trouble because of his injuries in that time trial. They're joined as well by Michele Coppolillo, so he's riding a very good Tour of Italy this year. As we look at the leader, this is Ribeiro going over the top of the climb. And they wonder really what has happened to Gonzalez, because he was riding very well indeed, but it may well be that he's paying for his rides over the last few days. Well, I'll tell you what, he's had a great day today, Kepi Gonzalez. He's been taking first place over all of the climbs, and so he's now beginning to run away with the King of the Mountains competition as his teammate is now beginning to take over at the front as well. This is the top of the Rio Molino and Ribeira is the leader. There's the gaps now on the screen and the important gap, it's a minute 25 between Tonkov and Gotti. Here goes Gotti. 
Gotti looking very good. You can see he's joined it still by Guerini, and he's going to try and build up as much of a lead as he can over Pavel Tonkov in these mountain stages because this is where Gotti has the advantage over the very strong Russian. Well, it looks as though Guerini is going to force himself uh, even higher up the overall classification now. And that is going to uh, pose a bit of a problem for the Palti team because they have a limping Luc Leblanc as well now, and Guerini is his teammate. This is Ribeiro, and he's never won a race in his life. He turned pro a couple of years ago, but today could be his big moment. You can see they're still suffering, trying to find friends left and right to help him. The Russian rider wearing number one, Pavel Tonkov, a long way behind, and it's amazing just how far this man, Ivan Gotti, has gone out. He's pulling it back, though. 44 seconds is their gap, and Gotti not getting any help from the rider from Palti now. Not surprising, I suppose, and Guerini knows that if uh, Ivan Gotti keeps going on this mission, he's going to drag him up into a high overall standing as well. He's already well up the charts anyway. And now, in fact, as we go back, Guerini, I think, has been told uh, to work. Now, that, to me, Paul, explains uh, to me that they're going to try and move Guerini up because they feel Leblanc is in too much difficulty. Well, I think Luke Leblanc is going to have a very difficult time. He was in difficulty in the first few kilometres of the stage this morning. He was already losing it on the first time we went over the climbs. And now, with just five kilometres remaining, it looks as if, really, the victory is going to go to José Luis Ribeira. But what's more important is the time gaps from this man in the pink jersey to Pavel Tonkov behind. Well, slowly but surely, this little group is getting itself organised here, but again, they're soaking wet in what is another chilly day in the Tour of Italy in the heavy, wet rain. And the pink jersey again has been given freedom now. He's beginning to look such a strong man in this race lead now. It's true what they say, isn't it? Put a race leader's jersey on a rider and he becomes two men. There's the sign there that uh, tells him five kilometres remaining. That gap is down to 39 seconds. So Tonkov is definitely not giving up. He's trying to pull himself back into the race. And a little bit further up the road, Gotti can see one or two riders who've been in the breakaways. If he can pick up with those riders, it may well be that he's got a good chance of working together with them and extending his lead over the rest of the pack. Which is already considerable, but I think a good lead today will sew it up for Ivan Gotti, even though he won't think so because of the big climb still to come in this race. Still three stages to come, only the one around Milan is the flat one. As we now look at Jose Luis Ribeira, who's never won a stage of anything in his life, and now the Kelme are beginning to celebrate a great Giro d'Italia this year. But performances like this by himself and also by Kepe Gonzalez, I feel sure, could get them a wild card to the Tour de France because that is certainly something that they're going to need if they want to ride the major event in July. But a great ride by this man, Ribiera. Well, that was the last string. Over goes the bottle. Now comes a huge smile from this rider. This is the greatest moment of your young career. He's winning his first professional bike race, a stage in the Tour of Italy. He's home and dry. And now we go back to the group here, which contains Roberto Conti in the white crash helmet. Gotti still continues to push home an advantage. Every pedal rev could mean a second over the second man in this race, Pavel Tonkov. And in this group as well, we've got Gonzalez sitting in the back. He has has consolidated his lead in the green jersey today for sure that looks like his now and also here climbing to a high overall position Giuseppe Guerini here comes the sprint now and it looks as though Conti has only ever won one bike race in his life has been beaten again because this time he gets second uh, Guerini is third Gotti is fourth and Gotti has come in around three minutes and eight seconds behind now this is the sprint containing Pavel Tonkov the clock has almost gone by a minute and so plus or minus another minute lost there for Pavel Tonkov to the race leader there's the winner Rubira he gets the stage win but of course the talk again is all about this brilliant man Ivan Gotti he really has shocked this time because he is now winning time back just about whenever he likes and there's two more days in the mountains still to come in the 80th Giro d'Italia and as we look at the overall, Giuseppe Guerini, Guerini is now third. The news reaching us, in fact, that LeBlanc retired halfway through the stage. So we now go on to the 20th stage, three stages left to go. The ride is now finishing right up here on the Paso del Tenali at the end of some 176 kilometres. A tough day's racing indeed. Very tough day's racing and again a chance for Ivan Gotti to try and extend his lead over the man Pavel Tonkov. The leading group got away very early on and built up a maximum lead of over 12 minutes on the pink jersey group. 
and all of the time Pavel Tonkov quite happy to stay in the group there with Ivan Gotti. But also Kepi Gonzalez, Paul, is having a tremendous ride through the mountains here in this leading group as well. And Evgeny Berzin finally putting in appearance in a breakaway. Berzin, by the way, he's still 22nd overall in this race, but he's 40 minutes and 20 seconds behind. Strange performance by him to, to look for small breakaways like this to try and get himself a stage victory. The man really is enigmatic. One day he's up and the next day he's down. Well, there's the big field now, and they must all be thinking that Gotti is going to win the Giro d'Italia because he is now leading by such big margins over the field. Now, one attack here, trying to get away off the front of the group, and this looks like it might be Podenzana having a dig again. Got a very good Tour of Italy, 26 in the overall standings, a long way down. He was seventh in the Tour of Italy in 1994, but I think much more liberated in this year's Tour of Italy by the fact that Marco Pantani had to withdraw because of that crash. And now a reaction coming here from Gianni Bugno, a man we haven't really seen a lot of in the Tour of Italy this year. And another enigmatic performer, because he really has been a great champion in the past, but I think now seeing one of his last few seasons out. And just look where he is overall, two and a half hours behind the leader and about to be collected by the main field. But this is the sharp end of the field here now, and Kepi Gonzalez again today has helped himself to a few points. He was second over the Paso del Mendola after 104 kilometres behind Poddenzana, in fact. The breakaway was already on, and the pink jersey at that stage nearly 15 minutes back. You can see there on the arm of uh, the second place rider, Pavel Tonkov, a little plaster starting to appear. It could well be that he's having a little problem with tendonitis due to one of the crashes he had earlier on and also the crash he had earlier in the season, which gave him a very badly injured wrist. And because of little broken bones he's had around the scaphoid region, though, he might well be feeling uh, some pressure there now as the tour has gone on for the best part of three weeks and these are the toughest stages and uh, asked little Kepi Gonzalez how he's enjoying his Tour of Italy and he'll tell you very much indeed. Nine kilometres to go now for Gonzalez and Poddenzana, they've got together. Pink jersey very firmly now on the shoulders of Van Gotti following the man who's his closest challenger. And look at this Paul, further up the mountain, Kepi Gonzalez, he can't contain his enthusiasm. He has shed Poddenzana, there's no way that Poddenzana will match this little climber once he gets going. And there's not a lot of reaction coming from behind at the moment, although that field also is beginning to split up. But Gotti now is just riding so well. Back up with the leader. Well, Ke Kepi Gonzalez is quite remarkable. As soon as the road tilts upwards, he goes out on the attack. And it's great to see the Colombians back because over the far last couple of years, Phil, they really have been in the doldrums. Well, you know, the last Colombian rider, I think, won a stage of the Tour of Italy was Oliviero Rincon, and that goes back to 1995. Four kilometres out now, and Kepi Gonzalez about to update the record books, I think, because they're not going to come too close to him. The face of Pavel Tonkov is really one of concentration at the moment, just trying to keep his second place comfortable. He realises that this final climb up to the finish could put him into danger again. Well, we're up to the snow line now at uh, the Passa del Tonali. And Gotti won't be worried too much about little Gonzalez. One kilometre to go, he checks over his shoulder to see if he can see the wily old uh, Massimiliano Poddenzana coming up, but I don't think he will now. <coughs> Tonkov trying there, but it wasn't really a full concerted effort. I think he just thought he needed to try because he's lying in second place in the overall standings, but it really was half-hearted. And another great day through the mountains, and another day he can tick off when he gets into his hotel tonight. Ivan Gotti, everything's gone his way. He's having absolutely no trouble. The retirement of Luc Leblanc, really very sad indeed, but he couldn't go on with those injuries. Let's hope he gets himself ready for the Tour de France. But it's amazing how Palti have found themselves a replacement in Giuseppe Guerini, who now holds Leblanc's third place overall. It was quite remarkable over the first few days of the Tour of, Tour of Italy here. He was in fact riding as the protector for Luc Leblanc, and he rode so well that he accompanied him on all the mountain stages and rode himself now up into third place. The personal battle then, one, two, three in the Giro d'Italia, they're lower down the slopes while meanwhile at the top, little Kepi Gonzalez becomes the seventh Colombian to win a stage of the Giro d'Italia. As he comes up to the line, he has really deserved this victory because he's ridden so well in this tour. He has ridden so well in the mountains, he has an almost unassailable lead in the King of the Mountains competition, which has been the domain of Piccoli for the past two years. Now Kepi Gonzalez gets the stage win.
Meanwhile, further down the mountain, the real leaders of the Tour of Italy are continuing their game. Here comes Poddenzana. He gets second over the line, and the 1 minute 43 already ticked by there. And so that means this group is still a fair way behind here, as uh, taking them through is Tonkov. Well, Tonkov trying again, but all the time he has a shadow, and the shadow has a pink jersey on its shoulders, and that's Ivan Gotti. Gotti looking very comfortable, more comfortable as we get towards the end of the Tour of Italy than he did at the start. I never would have put his name down as one of the challengers because everybody felt certain that the man who was going to walk away with a second victory was the man at the front now in blue, Pavel Tonkov. Because he looks so good in those early days and coming into this race with a good victory in the Tour of Romandie, I think everybody would have gone down the betting shop and put a few bob on him. But anyway, they might have lost it because it looks now as though Gotti has this race nicely stitched up. This is the strong group that's here now all around them, but they're still over seven minutes behind Gonzalez, who has finished. He's taking quite a slice of time now, but he won't really challenge the top ten overall. He might, with a bit of luck, fall scraping around tenth. He may well do, but a man caught in the middle of all this fighting is Evgeny Berzin. He managed to get across the line in eighth place. Well, this is the group coming in now, containing all the top riders on the overall, and in fact, they're approaching 10 minutes now since the arrival of Gonzalez. Here's the sprint, Conti in the white crash helmet, going to have a little go for it, I think. As he starts the sprint, the pink jersey of Ivan Gotti still got plenty of fight in him as well. But it's going to be a formality, I think, for Conti. But on the far right is Noah, who's still right up there on the overall, and in fact, Noah gets it right on the line. He'll be just ahead of Gonchar and Gotti and Conti. There's the result of the stage, though. The rest of the breakaway finishing uh, quite a few minutes behind the day's winner. Overall, uh, Tonkov still a minute 32 back. Now, we'll take a look at this, because this is the toughest stage of the Giro d'Italia, Paul, and it comes just one day from the finish. And Bunyo, of all people, has launched the attack. Well, it's quite remarkable because this is one of the toughest stages, 238 kilometers with the final climb, the Paso de Motirolo. And what a climb that is, and it really is a stage. If they want to put Ivan Gotti under pressure, this is the only chance they have left because tomorrow these riders will be in Milan. And so the breakaway are going after first a deal with uh, Gianni Bugno. There's the senior men all together as they lock into the big climb here. Well, I've got a feeling now that Gianni Bugno is starting to feel the pressure here. He was the leader over the second first category climb, the Cardinho. But now I think his legs have turned a little bit to jelly. This is a very tough stage indeed, and you see a man like Bugno suffering like this, you can understand just how steep the gradients are here. And this is the senior section of the race, and I must say now that Gotti knows that if he just controls immediately Pavel Tonkov, he's got this race in the bag. He is now over seven minutes ahead of the rest of the field. Well, as always, De Grande there on the left-hand side in the light blue Mappé jersey. He's the man who's trying to pace Tonkov into a position where he can try and take advantage of the strength that he has. But bobbing and weaving there in the pink jersey, Gotti is looking very good. He looks extremely good, he doesn't look in any trouble at all, and the teammates here at Tonkov look over the shoulder, they see Gotti looking in prime condition. I don't know whether we can say the same for Tonkov, as they start to move clear here. Even the Kelme boys are having a little bit of trouble today, and they're the big climbers, as we see uh, Serrano, who's also having a good tour in trouble there. And also Garini, who's third overall, it looks as if he's going off the back. These riders now getting onto the back wheel of Gianni Bugno, so that is quite a remarkable failure for him. He was riding well, and now he's been caught. Well, Bugno is going to really suffer on the Paso de Motorolo right now because this is a climb of 12 and a half kilometers and that man has been out front for so long his legs must be feeling pretty awful. Anyway, he's looking over his shoulder, Paul. He's seen the pink jersey coming up. I wonder if there's anything left there now for a little acceleration from him. Well, Gianni Bugno there wearing number two. He might be thinking one last time to try and put some pressure on for his man, Pavel Tonkov, wearing number one. Once again, the last chance to put this man, 151, Ivan Gotti, into difficulty. But I really don't think that Pavel Tonkov's got anything left. Well, this is absolutely showdown time now. Pavel Tonkov is looking for 1 minute 32 seconds. There are small time bonuses at the finishing line, but I don't think he's going to worry too much about those. Now, Bunyo is still trying to play the team helper here as he leads up uh, Pavel Tonkov. But just for how long can he do this? And it doesn't look to me as though Tonkov is under any pressure at all a motorbike has gone down on the right there and in fact I don't think Bunyo spotted it because Bunyo lost his rhythm and I think with it the lead group 
Well, that's very difficult indeed, but that is just how steep the corners are here on the Paso de Motirolo because they're very hard indeed. And it's amazing to think that an organizer like the organization of the Tour of Italy could put such a hard climb on the final penultimate stage. Well, it's not the time to remind these two that this is the climb where Miguel Indurain collapsed when he lost the tour, where Abraham Olano collapsed when he lost the tour. And uh, now it looks as though this time the pink jersey is having much better fortunes because he has put Tonkov under pressure. Quite remarkable Phil coming into this year's Tour of Italy in fact Ivan Gotti didn't have a, a win to his credit and the man in the blue jersey on the left hand side Pavel Tonkov well he'd come in after winning the Tour of Romandie which is supposedly the ideal preparation and a sign of the man who is in form. Well now it is side by side the top two riders in the Giro d'Italia and a little bit further down the man who used to be one of the great riders in the Giro d'Italia Gianni Bugno is drifting away into anonymity. These are the two men this year and Gotti is riding side by side with Tonkov. It reminds me Paul of the days of Raymond Poulidor alongside Jacques Anquetil. A big showdown. A big showdown. This is certainly the classic mano a mano. Man against man, man against machine and man against the mountain. It's it's a question of survival, these two riders are certainly the strongest riders of the Tour of Italy and Gotti again thinks he can get rid of Tonkov, but Tonkov I think now riding on pride. Well you wouldn't think these two are friends really because they train together when they're not racing but they have been locked in battle now and it's now day 21 of the Giro d'Italia and remember since day 3 they have been fighting each other for that pink jersey and still Gotti is trying to knock his man out. Well, the crowd here going crazy they realize there's a great chance for an Italian win but they I think also understanding the the rivalry between these two riders they are training partners and it has become certainly a great duel well as they continue up the climb here they're still shoulder to shoulder and uh, Gotti keeps looking across at Tonkov but I don't think there's a lot of fight left in Tonkov now he's just hoping to survive up this climb on the shoulder of the pink jersey sorry about the little bit of picture breakup it's caused as usual by the trees in the area interfering with the signals up to the helicopters of our motorbikes but even so these are the top two riders we're watching now in the 80th Giro d'Italia and next year number one is certain now to be Ivan Gotti well, 12 and a half kilometers but look at the gradient here 18 percent at this part of the climb and when they reach the top it'll be 1850 meters and that's almost the same altitude as the Alpe d'Huez. I have to say I'm surprised in fact that Gotti, uh, not Gotti, Tonkov can stay sat in the saddle here on the steepness of this climb. Look at the speed they're only climbing at uh, what 12 kilometers an hour around seven miles an hour. 1300 meters is the elevation of the pass and again pushing the pace once more is Ivan Gotti every time he needs to he tries to accelerate a little bit a little bit of change of direction there caused I think by the fact that the motorbikes were getting in the way but you can see the crowd now they want an Italian to win they know that last year it was Pavel Tonkov but this year it's going to be one of their compatriots well, whichever way you look at it, Paul, Tonkov has put up a great defence of his win last year. Just look at the crowds down there now. This is the final climb in the Giro d'Italia. And they've all come out to see the kill for Italy because they've had a long run of foreign winners of the Tour. Now they're set to get a home one. And it has to be said, it is a surprise. But uh, I must say that Gotti has ridden every day with greater strength than the day previously. Back further down the mountain now, the climb behind. And this rider, number 51, is Vladimir Belli. Well, Belly started the day in 7th place, 12 minutes 44 seconds back, and he is helping himself up the overall classification as well. well still 4 kilometres of agony to go for these two riders to get to the top of this climb, but certainly Vladimir Belly, who was 7th overall this morning, putting in an excellent climb, and this climb here could really change the, con the structure of the top 10 in the overall standings. Obelli has a little bit of time to make up, but as I say, seventh overall this morning. He might climb one or two places, depending on his time gains. And these two right, I think Gott is almost asking for water there off the, off the runner on his left, but he didn't get one. This is Belly. Belly making a little bit of progress up towards these two at the moment. In fact, there he is, Paul, just behind. That's been a fine piece of climbing by Vladimir Belly. All the pressure off him, of course. He's just climbed steady, and he's now going to come right up behind these two. Now, the good form, I suppose, if he's got the strength, is to try and go straight by. 
Well, that's how it is done in the handbooks, but I'm not sure <laughs> after a ride like that if he'll still have the strength to go straight by these two riders because it really is a question of just surviving, riding as fast as you can just to keep the bike in a forward motion. You can see Belly there all over his bike, twisting and pulling on those handlebars just to try and get as much power as he can into his pedaling action, and I think he'll just be happy to be with the two leaders. Two kilometres to the top, I always think it's a little bit of a shame, it's very difficult for cameras to show the real gradient of a climb, uh, but you can see by the speed of these riders just how steep it is. I think there you get some idea. Now a little bit further down the mountain too here, because this is uh, Mikeli in the yellow jersey trying to get back on terms as well. Certainly over the last few years, Phil Gotti really has improved as a stage race rider. He was fifth in the Tour de France in 1995, fifth in the Tour of Italy last year, but even so, to go from there up to wearing the pink jersey on the penultimate day is really quite a performance. And that's what the Italians think of the situation now. They've got themselves an Italian leader of the Giro. Uh, this will uh, bring uh, a new spate of publicity for this, this event now, as the people will love it once more. They've had a couple of Russian winners, they've had the Spanish victories of Miguel in Jirain, and now it looks as though it's swinging back. Today, Gotti, as the climb continues towards the end, and I think that's about right now, uh, number one in Milan will be Ivan Gotti, because we're only a few hundred metres from the top of the last climb, and what a climb to finish on the tour with. 50 seconds is the gap to Mikli and Noe, and Noe, by the way, Mikli, are not very far in front of Ghiarini, so he is on the climb somewhere, and he should be maintaining his third place overall. It's like D'Artagnan and one of the knights of the round table trying to help these riders out here, running alongside. It's a very difficult thing for riders to have all this water poured over them, but at the moment, I think with the heat, they're not too worried because all they want to do is just get over the final kilometre. Well, Belly certainly seems to be enjoying the shower. A few dregs for Tonkov, but not too much. And now Belly starts to move clear again. Now, is this the acceleration to claim the top of the mountain and then perhaps plunge down to the finish? Very narrow ride this is for these riders. All the crowd coming in onto the side of the road and starting to get quite fanatic about the fact that they've got two Italians at the head of affairs and they're wearing number one as last year's winner, Pavel Tonkov. Tonkov's having none of it now, uh, Belly has been brought back to hill as he follows him up the climb. The crowd still enjoying the moment and just look at them now as they cheer these riders around the corner. Two Italians and a Russian, but of course he's on an Italian team. Chance there Phil, just to see how steep these corners are on the Motirolo, it really is a hard climb. I don't think I'm going to take my bike out there for a bit of a fun ride. I was just thinking the same thing myself, but now we've got Vladimir Belly, the last man to join the two leaders, now setting the pace here. You can just about see the road, I think, because these are very emotional scenes by the Italians, and don't forget, they are an emotional lot, really, when it comes to supporting big names in sport. And now it's one kilometre to the summit of the final climb. Well, I think they've been looking for that sign for quite a long time now because although it's 12 and a half kilometres from top to bottom, it's a very difficult climb and these riders now have been climbing for something like 45 minutes. Well, they're thanking Ivan Gotti in that sign and I think they're trying to pat him on the back as well because they know today he won the Tour of Italy. He has put up with all of the pressures. He's actually trying to push them away. He's had enough of it now as the crowd gets dragged out the way of our camera as well. And somewhere up at the top of this climb, we're going to see a banner across the road, I hope, because Belly is leading the other two riders up towards the top. Well, a very dangerous moment there for Gotti. In fact, those riders getting a little bit too overzealous and getting too close. And I remember a couple of years ago, a rider being taken off on one of the climbs of the Tour de France, the Col de Galibier, and that was Gianni Bugno and Robert Miller, I think. And that is exactly how dangerous it can be for these two riders. So that probably went through the mind of Ivan Gotti there, just thinking that he was so close to the finish, or one of his own supporters could have put him out of the race. And back in 1987, of course, uh Stephen Roach, who went on to win the Giro d'Italia, was finding himself a quite a worried man riding through the Italian Tifosi uh, because they wanted their man Vicentini to win and uh, Roach was being pushed around by the crowd all the way up the climb. But when he did, and now it looks as though it's going to be Gotti's turn. A little bit of respite on towards the top of the climb as the three of them ride up to the summit and I think they're probably going to allow Belly to be first over the top. It doesn't mean a lot to any of them. There is a prize, of course, for the first rider over the top but there's a much bigger prize for the man that wins the Giro and he's happy enough where he is. 
as I think are some of the greatest spectators I've seen on the Tour of Italy for many years. They really do seem to have come back to the race with a vengeance. The race I felt a few years ago was starting to die, but really since Miguel Indurain and top riders started to take this race very seriously, the crowds have certainly come back. Well, here they come around one of the final bends and still that we have a belly leading there's the altitude 1852 meters and very soon now we are going to see the summit just about enough road left to ride on i think and uh, i just wonder how gotti is feeling now well i don't i know how he must be feeling he's going to be feeling pretty good he knows now the tour is his but belly still sitting at the front there trying to find a way through the crowd the crowd going absolutely balmy on this final few meters of this year's tour of italy's last climb because they know that their man is going to win there he is in the pink jersey in second position pavel tonkov i think just happy now to ride over the top of this climb because once they get to the top there's 17 kilometers of downhill to the finish well the situation behind has got he waves away the crowd there Michele, Guirini, Di Grande, Noe and Rubira are round about a minute and a half behind this group and they're climbing all split up and I'm not surprised on the way to the summit as well Strangely enough Phil, one man we haven't spoken a lot about is still in the Tour of Italy this year, Mario Cipollini and I think that's going to be his first finish for several years Indeed it is, I think uh, 1992 actually Paul and you know, a lot of people think he's never finished the Tour of Italy but in fact he has finished three of his tours of Italy. Anyway these are the leaders now making their way to the top, uh, Mario Cipollini still one day to go and a possible win tomorrow in Milan that would give him a record five stages, that's a personal record by the way but right now Ivan Gotti is just dreaming of Milan and his final Maglia Rosa. There he is up towards the summit now, all of the pressure will all of a sudden disappear in this year's race as he climbs towards the final mountain banner of the tour. 1,852 metres, it's a very long way from the bottom of the valley here. 12 and a half kilometres they've been climbing and around about 50 minutes at the top and it looks as if Vladimir Obelli's smiling as he reaches the top. Yes, and it does look as though he's going to be the man who says he won the climb too because I don't think Gotti is going to challenge and I think the towel has been thrown in by Pavel Tonkov because he hasn't been in a position to offer any attack at all on this climb. I think Gotti proved to him midway up the climb he was just too good and so Tonkov decided to settle down and just go up the mountain with the group. There's the banner, and under it goes first Belly, second Gotti, third Tonkov. So now they're heading down towards the finish in Adolo, and that will be music in the ears now of Ivan Gotti. Tricky descent for these riders, and you can see how many cars have turned out as we look a little bit further back. This is Noe coming up with Nicola Michelli. And he's done a very good ride indeed. Round about 90 seconds, these riders are down on the three leaders and a lot further down there'll be a lot of men just trying to get their bodies over this final climb and now the long descent and some sharp hairpin bends and it could be that Belly is trying to rid them down here because you know he might take a few risks but certainly Gotti is not going to take too many and it looks as though Tonkov is going to take even less of a risk and you can't blame him for that, Tonkov lying right off the back of these three as they look at the route and find their own way down the mountain well Tonkov has been joined again by Gotti while Belly is trying to take a little run for home back down the mountain, or back up the mountain rather here comes Gianni Bunyo and he's coming over the top an awful long way behind now he looks pretty tired and I'm not surprised it was a long escape and it has been a long way to the top of this mountain well, it would have been a great stage for him to win, but at the moment the race is on at the front. Tonkov starting to lead them on the descent here, and I think Gotti now just happy to sit in his slipstream. He's not going to take too many risks to try and catch Belly. And you can't blame him for that really, Belly wants to pull out a little lead, oh and good deep, Belly's overshot the bend, he scraped the wall here, the other two are straight by him immediately without a blink, and so now from first to third in one easy movement, he's going to have to start catching up, that will have shaken his nerve a little bit. Well, here's a chance just to see exactly how it happened. He came in there, and in fact, he didn't even fall off his bike. His shoulder went into the ramparts there, and that's quite remarkable that he didn't lose it. But just look at the speed those other two riders came by him. Well, he was lucky to get out of that one. It was a little reminiscent of the crash that took uh, Luc Leblanc out of the race. It wasn't with the same force, of course. And uh, Belly back on his bike now, and they get back to the leaders, no problem. Uh, he was a little bit lucky there, but there have been some strange crashes this year, Giro, and uh, most of them going down steep hills. Now back to the other top of the climb, and look at this rocking and rolling now of Mario Cipollini. Is he popular or what? He must have had a little helping hand, I think, up most of the climb, but it doesn't stop him going over the top 
some 12 minutes behind the leaders. Eight kilometers to go. Well, that little accident there certainly rocked the foundations of Vladimir Obelli. See how he's just laying off the back a little bit now. Won't take the risks he was taking before because once you have an incident like that, you really do you lose your nerve. Well, he's having to fight back just to stay in touch now with the other two riders on the way down to the bottom of the valley. Six kilometres to go. Well, normally, Paul, somebody like Tonkov would take a sprint out at the result like this. That would be quite a turn up now if Tonkov stole the stage, wouldn't it? Most well, certainly would. He's got up against two other riders. I feel if these three riders do stay together, he's got a very good chance. But that doesn't mean that these three riders behind don't have a chance of coming back because they were only 90 seconds behind at the top of the climb. So it may well be they'll pull something back. Well, that's Mikali Girini and the Kelme rider is Rubira, who's got himself in the action again towards the end of the stage. These are the three riders, there's the kilometre kite now. It's going to be a three-man sprint for the line. A two Italians and a Russian and a pink jersey again in at the kill at the end of a crucial stage. He has been a most consistent leader this year. Well, if I was Vladimir Obelli, I'd drop myself back into third position now and just try and surprise these two riders because obviously a lot of animosity between them, but you can see Gotti's decided he's going to go for the win. Well, he's gone. He's full of confidence. And Belly now not smiling this time. In fact, he's left a little bit of a gap here. He'd do well to force Tonkov to take up the chase, but Tonkov just staying on the wheel. Little rise now. And in fact, looking over his shoulder, Gotti's just checking. Here comes Belly this time now. So he has got some speed left in those legs, but that sharp left hander has taken a little bit out of him. Now, this is a long lead out by Ivan Gotti, and it usually means you get third place when you lead from so far out. And it could well be the case because Pavel Tonkov is going for his third stage win and he may not be going to win the Tour of Italy but he has won the toughest stage of the race what a turn up Tonkov gets it and in fact Gotti stays second and Belly gets third now back down the line here because this is the chase group coming in and this is Ribeiro who's going to take out fourth place so Ribeiro gets fourth from Noe and Mikali was there and Ghiarini also. So that's the order over the line. There'll be no change in the top three overall, but the time gaps continue to open. And the overall situation now is that Ivan Gotti leads Pavel by a minute and 27 seconds. Ghiarini is seven minutes and 40 seconds back. Next stop, Milan and the big finale. And there it is, just 165 kilometres remaining of the 80th Giro d'Italia. And this is one race that the Italians will love to recall on video for many, many years to come. Because there's no doubt now they're going to have an Italian winner. Now, it would be a perfect race, Paul, if they could finish off with a win for Cipollini. Well, it would, but it's very difficult on the last day. Everybody wants to get the last little bit of energy out of their bodies. They try and make sure they can get themselves at least on television one time. And coming up to the last kilometre, it looks again as if it's Fabiano Fantanelli very close to the front. Well, they've done 10 laps here of the Sempioni Park, 5.5 kilometres a time around. There's been plenty of attacks and plenty of riders try to slip away, but each time, just like on the Champs-Élysées in the Tour de France, they've all been brought back. And so now, looking for what would be his 21st stage win of a Giro d'Italia and his fifth and a personal record in one tour. He's in uh, fifth place down at the moment, just following through. Glenn Magnussen is the rider on the front. I think that was Sergei Uchikov who nipped away out of our camera and so now it looks as though uh, Uchikov might steal the show here as he tries to go clear of the field because he's got the little march remember he was the rider that crashed out when he went around that sweeping left hand bend and we thought he'd broken his hand but he hadn't but now this time around it's not going to work out for him either and big Cipollini is coming for stage win number five like an express train Magnussen is second Mario get your goodness me almost fell off and uh, Magnussen first to congratulate him I think or complain whichever the case may be this was the sprint uh, quite a regular sprint the fastest man got it by a good length well I'll tell you what Paul five wins isn't too bad is it it's not too bad at all that makes 21 stage victories of the Tour of Italy for Mario Cipollini and the shorts go very nicely with the shirt thank you and so will the fine later on today but he won't mind it's in his contract in fact that his sponsors pay all the fines for wearing the wrong coloured shorts 
So Mario Cipollini, now 21 wins. Congratulates his teammate who won the race, Ivan Gotti. Here's the stage result first, though. Cipollini winning ahead of Magnussen. Manzati, Manzati getting her first appearance in the top six finishes. There he is. He's turned up in his suit. He went behind the stage, changed to a white suit to receive what would have been the winner's jersey. But he always is a character. And the champagne, anyway, he's going to spray the crowd with it and make sure he doesn't go on his suit. Cipollini as popular as ever. Overall, though, this is the new star of Italian cycling. Ivan Gotti, after 102 hours in the saddle, has beaten Pavel Tonkov by a minute and 23 seconds. In third place, Giuseppe Guerini at 7 minutes 40. All three of them tomorrow morning will probably meet at some street cafe and go training together, as they always do between the big races. What a result. I hope you've enjoyed this year of Italia. I think it's one to be remembered for many, many years to come. And until the next time we meet, I'm Phil Liggett for Paul Showing saying so long for now. Again and welcome to Belgium. Well, this was the second year World Cycling Productions decided to organise a trip for those who wanted to come to join us on the Classics at the early start of the season. And we chose them as last year, the Tour of Flanders, Ghent Wevelgem and the Paris-Roubaix Classic in France. We started by bringing the group out into Ghent, most famous cycling city, and then we moved down to Courtrijk. We took them over to see some of the circuits of the four days of Dunkirk, and we went to the Tour of Flanders, and we went to Compiègne in France for Paris-Roubaix. These are the riders arriving in St. Nicholas Square here now to sign on for the Tour of Flanders, and it was a chance for Paul Sherwin to meet his old friend Max Chandry. Thanks, Phil. Well, just at the start line here, we're with Max Chandry, who's always been one of the great riders in the Tour of Flanders. Max, it's a nice day for the race today. How are the legs? legs are pretty good, uh, the morale is good, the condition is good, the weather is good. Yeah, thanks Max. Now, Johan Musea, what do you think of our trip? It's something special, yeah. You'll love every minute of it, Johan, but you do the riding and we'll do the watching. So the field all ready to roll away on the blue skies. 10 o'clock in the morning in Belgium, always a good time for a beer and a cheer. And Johan Museo has plenty of supporters. They're all around the course. And Paul Sherwin's found one or two very close to him. You know, Paul sometimes does ask the most ridiculous question. Who do you guys support? Jalabert! Quiet on the set. Andre Schmiel! Quiet on the set. Absolutely, some of us are trying to work here. Well, the fans are right about one thing. Laurent Jalabert wasn't enjoying his tour of Flanders. He's being dropped here. A man we missed at the start, we don't usually miss them, we found at the finish. He won the race, of course, Rolf Sorensen. Yeah, last to ride in, but first to come on at the finish. The great thing about World Cycling Productions is at least Tim Grady knows where to take us for a good meal. If it's not Bratwurst, it's Escargo. And the great thing is, Tim, when you do take us for a bike ride, please leave the organisation up to the experts, because we know what it's all about. Now, Mr Grady, you can see why I wanted to put the roof rack on. OK. One of the greatest things about Belgium, Phil, is that you can get away from the traffic and you can ride along some of the most beautiful cycle paths in the world. All of the canals that they have in Belgium here really have these great paths alongside them. You can ride carefree, not worrying about the traffic. It's a great place to go. And the weather in Belgium invariably lovely at this time of the year. And this, the lace capital of Belgium, Bruges. Well, Paul Schoen went to the old Quaramont. Tim was just in front of him. Just a little bit faster, Tim. This is the part of the old Quaramon that I always thought was the toughest part. Everybody's queuing to get over the steep part. Shit. Big two, go ahead. 
This is the part that I always think is the toughest part of the old choir. Well, after Paul Showen finally got his words out, we then moved on to the Menon Gate in Ypres. And it's here where this big memorial is to the First World War and the walls are covered in the many, many thousands of names of the soldiers who fell here in that tragic occasion. Then it was back onto our bikes and out into the country. Quite a nice little group, including Chris and Mark on their tandem, and they were always at the back, and I must remind them about doing some pacemaking at the front occasionally, Paul. Trying to get legged. I'm about ready to blow here, I think. <laughs> well, you've seen what uh, Mr. Grady left at the side of the road as a souvenir. Yeah, I just blew, I told you I was to blow at the top of the hill, we just didn't know it was going to be out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, the sheer talent of the man. Just put my makeup on, hang on. Grady's rubbish. The way he came up that hill there, uh, I don't know why he rides a bike with He looks so sick. And so to France, although the signs may not give you that impression. Yeah. Well, anyway, Paul, when we get to this next junction... And even yeah. on the road, Phil Liggett like has right. to keep in touch. He only attacked because he couldn't understand a word that Paul was saying. The three musketeers on the roads of France. And now this is when we gather speed, just look at this. Now you might get the impression that Motorola did impress us the years they were in sponsorship. Either that Paul or the jerseys were going cheap. I think we got a very good price, but the great thing about Tim Grady's tours is the fact that we're going to go out and ride some of the races, the roads where the greatest races in the world take place. The important thing though is like to icebergs, really. make sure you ride Four in front of Mr road. Grady. You have to ride in front of Tim Grady because he tends he to cheated. make them slip. He cheated, he went on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. yeah. You went on the sidewalk. Well, oh, halfway up, I went well, on the you sidewalk. Some, you're <laughs> some kind of a sissy. Well, this is my second time sissy out Sissy Grady. Oh. I wear gloves and I go on the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> what? Gloves? Gloves are for sissies. Now, I think there's ample evidence here, Paul, you should not put your tandem in the washing machine. No, because it looks to me like it had shrunk. I'd never seen a machine like that, but you do see the roads are very good and there's still a lot of those Motorola jerseys at the front of the pack. Back to the action, boys. This is now life at the start of Ghent Wavelgum, and it's autograph time for Franco Ballerini. Of course, for us, it's back to work. Paul, first of all, a tip for victory today. I think everybody in Belgium thinks that Tom Steels is going to be one of the riders. He won the event last year. He's already won... F okay. <laughs> And he blew that. He Who is a he? Close up shot of his nose. <laughs> Here we go. You guys look good. Oh, shit. It was good. It was going well. <laughs> hmm. Did well, you see, somebody walked in front of our shot. But we managed to find Peter van Pietergum. He was in happy mood. Eric Zaba, well, his big win. He's already got it. Milan San Remo. And this man wins whenever he likes. He didn't win this one, though. Oh, how do you do? Just put uh, to Marcel. Yeah, on the forehead. Good on you. Good on you, mate. Good on you. No, mate. Not mate the best rider. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Liggett. Oh, thanks. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Marcel. Oh. You're wonderful. Good luck today. I will be very biased <laughs> in the commentary now. All righty. Thanks, mate. I see ya. Well, that's like the world upside down. The riders asking the commentators for autographs. And if you want to get some souvenirs and you haven't got any photos of Greg LeMond, you can still find them here in Belgium. I always think the best place to see the race though is at the top of the old Quaramont, but we'll go across to the Kemmelberg instead where there's a great cafe, you can have a beer and watch the riders go by. There's Big Mario enjoying every minute of it. Now Tim Grady's gone down to the finish, he fancies a bet. A fool. Well, in case you're interesting, he lost, so did everybody else. Who would have expected Philip Gaumont to win this race? Well, he did for a start. This was a great race. There'll be plenty more to come. On behalf of Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Liggett saying, until the next time.
which isn't too far away, but it's day off time again now. We've moved to this delightful hotel in the centre of Courtraig and we can all get back on with our bike riding now. And after all, that's why we all came here in the first place. It's time to face up to the action, so let's join it. Where are we? Oh, yeah. Well, whatever you want to do. Hello, camera. How are you this morning? I right, couldn't be better. Your Mr. thoughts for the big ride today, sir? Well, I'm going to hold back until we get to the old Quaramonda thing, and then I'll just uh, do one or two jumps. And if, uh, if I get clear, then I'll keep pressing on for the finish. But otherwise, I'll sit up and let uh, the five of us regroup, and we'll go down as a mass sprint finish. Either way, I'll probably win. Or, more frankly, I'll probably lose. Anyway, this is the top of the climb. Lovely cafe, this. There's always somebody, though, who's last up the climb. And by the time they get to the top, well, let's face it, we've all finished. It's a great place to stop. On race day, you can't get in there, but on the days before, we can take a little bit of time to see some of the other personalities who join us on World Cycling Productions. And our ardent cameraman, Joe Horowitz, he tries a bike for probably the first time in his life. Quite remarkable the position of the man as he comes up for his first win. I got my heart jumping and my core puzzles are pumping. Ready to go. Wonderful little hotel. We'll meet you there for lunch. Okay. We'll have oh, the, having lunch. We'll have the Liggett no. table set. And there we are. Beautiful sunny day. There's the table as usual. Nobody around to join me. And Graham Watson, also as usual. We usually find him sitting at the bar. And there he is. What are you doing? Paul Sherwin. How's your room, sir? Awful. What's wrong with your room? It's absolutely disgusting. It's too comfortable. It's too big. The bath is too deep and I'm having too much of a good time. But the big problem is I have to share it with Mr. Watson and he's always got those cameras around and I never know what he's going to take a photograph of next. Hopefully it won't be me in the nude. Maybe it'll just be Mr. Watson. But we've been having a great time here. The high spot, I think, for me was seeing Joe Horowitz, horrible Horowitz, the great Belgian Dutch Polish sprinter on the slopes of the Old Quaramal. It was a marvellous time for me. It was indeed, and as the race uh, goes on, our form continues to improve. Off to the voice of Orenberg, Paul showing my domestique. You know, one of the nice things of making the videos for World Cycling Productions is that we get to ride some of the courses as well. Paris Bay for Paul Sherwin and I is always an experience. And the man in black continues to wrap it on while the rest of the group continues to drive over the cobblestones, which in 48 hours will be the scene of the next Paris Roubaix. What a remarkable position of the man in black, and the first time I ever had of riding on the cobblestones with Phil Liggett. Sylvia, our faithful follower, always there in reserve in case anybody has a slight problem over the cobblestones of the north of France. By the end of these cobblestones, both of my hands were bleeding, but we enjoyed every minute of it because Tim Grady paid for the cakes at the end. Compiègne, a wonderful place just to spend a couple of days leading up to Paris-Roubaix. The restaurants are great, the gardens are beautiful, and at the end of the day, the Belgian beer is still around. And the crowd now waiting in the square at Compiègne. The stars are there, so let's have a look at them. What are you laughing at? I'm ready with you. Are. <laughs> Well, that was one stand-up we didn't do. This is Fred Moncassan and Andre Schmil. They've all come to play on the cobblestones again and with some success. What's it like to be a world champion? Well, quite annoying, really, because you've got to keep signing autographs. And Rolf Sorensen, he wasn't going to come. Then somebody gave him a World Cup leader's jersey, so he felt he had to. And our group witnessed a great Paris-Roubaix. It really was a classic. One man rode it for the first time and enjoyed it. Oh, it's just incredible. I had shivers down my spine. Really. I don't care about myself. Max! Ah, come on, Max, you love him, really. Anyway, after the race is over, by tradition, we're all invited to the party. You don't see food like this too often. And if you don't enjoy the food, well, the late night drinking sessions with Liggett talking about the history of the race are just as much fun. Phil remembers all of these riders. Thank you very much, Paul. I know this uh, tape will be treasured by those who took part in our special trip and I hope next time we see some more of you join us. We had a great time.